All right, all right. What's up, party people? It's your boy BQ with the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review with my boy Ro the Great. Adam is on vacation this week as well. He will return next week. Um, Ro, have you heard the news? We are now the number two Impact Wrestling YouTube channel and podcast. Well, that's nice to hear, but who's number one? I'm bullshitting you. We're still the number one place to be for the <laughs> news, reviews, interviews, and more in the world of Impact Wrestling. So, uh, I don't even know why I'm, a- why I'm asking you this question, because the answer is always no. Did you watch uh, Rise of the Knockouts last night? Does what Impact uploaded on their social media account? See, you're part of the problem now. That, that's what, <laughs> <laughs> like the whole ratings thing. We'll, we're going to get into that here in a second. No, but, um, you know, you and I were discussing previously. It is a little hard now to kind of keep up with the content. It's uh, that, That's why I've said with the Global Wrestling Network... I want them to have some little less wrestling content because sometimes it's just hard to watch all that stuff, especially with all the uh, wrestling going on in the world. But uh, I so I was at the show. I arrived pretty late. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I missed some of the matches, but um, main event was spectacular. Uh, Sue Young's match with uh, Soraya Knight was really really good too. So yeah, check it out. It was uh, it was on. Um, on Twitch, but I guess, I don't know, you probably didn't hear then, uh, I guess the Twitch stream was not working for a while. Yeah, I've seen that, they, the, the, uh, social media, the Impact social media, they had mentioned that. Yeah, I, I hope it's, um, I hope it's uploaded to Twitch, cause, cause it was a good show. You know, we talked about last week where Rise looked like it was potentially going out of business. Um, they had a sellout in Los Angeles, and then, I will say for this show, it was packed. Maybe there were some general admission seats left, but I would have considered it pretty close to a sellout. It was uh, it was pretty packed, pretty loud, and uh, you yeah, you saw my pictures right that I uploaded. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. So is it because I was noticed the one with uh, Rosemary? I noticed it looks like her appearance is different from Impact. Is that something that she's just doing all together? Is that just something that she's do- that her appearance changes for Rise? Now, when she does a uh, independent show, she usually takes her face paint a little bit more back to like the more the demonic look and everything but she's always had a different look for the indies than for the shows but mm-hmm. on rise she's like the manager for um what the hell's her name dust and something she she was the uh, they won the uh, tag team titles but she's like their manager basically oh, okay. okay so uh I, I tell you her and ally were they clean up with this demon bunny stuff um when i went to tried and true pro in tennessee some months ago it was her and crazy uh, Rosemary and crazy Steve there. I mean, the line was insane and uh, they're just, just moving merchandise. Um, but, but yeah, those two, those two are cleaning up. That's why they need to treat Allie, right. Um, need to treat Rosemary, right. Like a lot of people when Braxton Sutter got released, they're like, Oh, no big loss. Nah. Those two have traveled together pretty much their whole career. That is her husband at the end of the day. And uh, I think it would behoove you to keep Allie happy because she does. They do have their own brand now that they can uh, put on the road together. So definitely keep them happy, but got a chance to, I saw Sienna. So she was just there watching. She was hanging out in the back because they didn't have her doing commentary. So uh, I saw her peeking back there and I waved and she came and talked to me and my daughter for a while. And then uh, we went and talked to Alicia and she said uh, in the future to hit her up again and she'll come back on the channel. And, um, but yeah, but her and I chopped it up for a while. She's she's super cool. Um, I realized how much I'm aging when I took a picture with her and, and saw that she could uh, pass for my daughter. <laughs> yeah, she was she was cool. We chopped it up for a little bit. She was sitting uh, with her parents, and then uh, yeah, we got in the line for Allie and Rosemary. It's pretty long, and uh, so Allie didn't recognize me, and I could tell she was tired. The line was long, so I really didn't. Uh, she knew I was coming. And she was like, make sure you introduce me to your daughter. And uh, she didn't, and I could tell she didn't really like recognize me. So we just kind of did our thing. And then uh, we went over to Rosemary and Rosemary recognized me. And we talked for a little while. She said, we'll get the interview done. Cause I have the interview schedule for her with her and Allie. But I was telling her, I said, yeah, Allie said to wait till the end of the year. And she's like, don't listen to the bunny. So she's like 
when you're talking to her, she's like out of character, but she still refers to Allie. Like she still kind of talks in the Rosemary voice, but she talks normal. Mm-hmm. You know, so <laughs> she's like, "Don't listen to the bunny. She does. She knows not what she's talking about." Yeah, it, it's good. It's good to see. You know, good to see her because she still. When when is she scheduled to be back? I mean, I know you know normally with that type of injuries, what a, what six to eight months recovery time. Yeah, if I had to take a shot in the dark, I think she'll be back for the first set of tapings in 2019. Because I think she's going to be cleared this year, but I think the final tapings for the year is November, and I don't oh. think she'll be ready by then. So considering you know it'll go through December, unless unless maybe there's a no no actually there probably is a set of tapings in December because it, it sounds like they're doing monthly now. Okay. Because they just announced. In November, they're doing tapings in Las Vegas. Did you see that? Yeah, I seen that. That's I, you know, I started getting flashbacks for the, uh, who, uh, was it the Amped? Remember at yeah, that Global one? Global Force. <laughs> yeah, at that uh, arena that they that they had. That's why I was, that was the vibe that I was gonna say. Maybe they'll use that arena. Yeah, it, it's possible. No, no, I don't know. It's I know they're partnering with. Um, I was gonna call them World of Sport, but it's like a, I don't remember what they're called. But they're partnering with a um, promotion out there. I would have to believe that Bound for Glory is going to be there. I mean, they didn't really say it, but they said it's three days of tapings. So it's either one one night only, and then two sets of or two days of taping, or it's the pay per view. Uh, you know, Bound for Glory, and two days of taping. I mean, it, it would make sense because last year they did Bound for Glory in November. Yeah, I guess we just have to see, but yeah, that does make sense. That does make sense, though. But we'll see. It could be in. It could be in October too. But hopefully, that would uh, that would that would be pretty cool. That's like a four hour drive for you, so. Yeah, I know. I'm coming to the realization, man. They're not gonna get too close to Southern <laughs> Cali, man. So I said one of these days I might just have to fly. You know, whether it's Vegas. I mean, like like you said, that's just four hours. But yeah, man, I've been hoping that they'd come a little bit closer this way. I know a couple months ago they were in Northern California, so that was like a five-hour drive as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I did I did four hours of Rise of the Knockouts, um, and then, shit, WrestleCon was like 11. <laughs> <laughs> I had plenty of time off at the time, so it wasn't a big deal. But um, I wish I could have stayed today for the Rise Ascent tapings, but I had military duty today. Couldn't get out of it. Um so, uh, ratings were up this show to 304,000. So thank God they were back up. But did you see that there was a report that came out that it's funny. Cause we just had this conversation last week about the ratings th- that the impact management is concerned that people are watching the clips on YouTube. Yes. And I mean, I know you're probably going to get into this, but I think your point, you hit the nail on the head. Um, they do give too much of the show on YouTube. I remember during the time when I didn't have a destination America and they were on destination America, I was able to watch the whole show on YouTube. So I think what they have to do is, you know, you show your, you know, various highlights or the high moments throughout the show, but you can't give the whole show on YouTube because then that there's really no incentive to watch it live, let alone, you know, watch it in, in its entirety. Right. They, they give away way too much. I feel like uh, they tried things a little bit different this time around. I, I just saw the social media, the s- social media stuff they did was a little bit different. Um, they actually did, and they did this in the past too, but they were, and maybe they always do this. I just haven't seen it, but they were actually doing like clips before the show. So they were doing like, you know, like here's a, it was like a 15 second clip of Rich Swan and Phoenix. Uh, they did a clip of Killer Cross's entrance. So, you know, maybe something like that works, but but they definitely they definitely cover way too much on YouTube. So I don't know. The YouTube numbers are always good. They're um they're not in relation to the subscribers though. For having a million and a half, like they should actually be a lot higher than they are. But but the numbers are still pretty good. So we'll see if it um. Well, if it keeps up, do you think that from week to week, it's just sometimes people feel like DVRing it and sometimes they don't? I think it's a combination between that and then also, too, I, I want to say the biggest thing is the promotion of matches. I want to say, and we were even uh, talking about this previously, how the match with Rich Swan and Phoenix, how, you know, that was like a must see. 
And then you think about with the Kong and Cage, the people who went to the tapings, without spoiling it, they were just saying, hey, make sure when this match airs, you want to catch it. So I think with the word, word of mouth, factoring in as well as the promotion of some of these big matches that's what's going to help will help the ratings like i said you know i really don't look too much into them because i understand people watch impact they don't necessarily watch it live sometimes whether it's a dvr whether they watch from stream whichever platform they use uh and sometimes you know that doesn't factor in the total viewership but i think the key thing is the promotion you know promoting some of these big matches not just relying solely on for uh, twitter you know, other doing other channels, having the, you know, promotional packages on pop, whatever you can do, that's what's going to help. Yeah, and um, something I've said several times in the past is that, you know, they tend to hype up their shows and their matches. They you know they're stacked, they're must-see, and they've become buzzwords that mean absolutely nothing now because um, they throw it out there so much. And that's why I have said, like, you have to let, and we've talked about this too, over text and everything like you have to let people generate the buzz you have to let the industry generate the buzz you cannot generate the buzz you can generate the stories and see how people run with it but that's you know when i was learning music marketing when i was doing music you know there was times i would do a record that i'm like man this song is so good um and i learned not to hype up my shit because if i played it for someone and i didn't get like that out that eyebrow raise like oh damn this is good then it really wasn't as good as i thought you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I might have liked everything. So, you know, I kind of learned to a point, you know, the people are going to tell me what's good and what's not good. And uh, Impact has to do that, too. Like, they have to just stop saying, check this, Matt. This is all, oh, you know, look at this match right here. Look at this car. Just, just fucking put the information out there, and people are going to do the talking. And that's what happened with the Phoenix and Rich Swan match. That's what happened with the final deletion. You know, like they just they just allowed the buzz to build organically. That's that's really the key. You know, Ring of Honor does that real well. Like I follow their social media, even though I don't watch a whole lot of the product and they never they just like, hey, here's what we got going on. And people get excited about it. You know, even even the um, the all in was a uh, that was all marketing. That wasn't no like we're not promoting the matches. We, they just they, they let people get excited about it on their own without even announcing a single match. So uh, they just need to learn from those things. But but thank God, ratings were up. Um, we're going to get into the review here quickly. We're not going to do a trivia question this week. But uh, last week, no one... We we actually only had two people answer, and they were both wrong. Uh, what was the, the correct answer? The answer was Sienna. So it was Sienna. I think we got one Awesome Kong and one Taryn Terrell. And uh, yeah, for some reason... There was no participation last week. Usually there's <laughs> all sorts of people answering. So um, we got one question I want to talk about real quick. Uh, Colby Cooper wrote in on YouTube. I want to talk about this one. Then we'll get into Impact, which, is a, which was a really good show this week, uh, this past week. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here because I'm not staring at the question. But he, he basically asked, do we think that Impact will pull uh, Austin Aries with Madison Rain, have her win the knockouts title, and... Um, basically help bridge the gap between impact and, and ring of honor as far as a working relationship. So kind of like Austin Aries is, you know, appearing on both shows, Madison rain obviously has that relationship with ROH, you know, is this match at Slammiversary a, a ploy to put the knockouts title on her to take it over to ring of honor. What do you think about that? I don't think so. Only because if I'm not mistaken, when Austin Aries appeared at the most recent Ring of Honor event, they didn't announce him as Impact World Champion, did they? They did not announce him, but the uh, commentary team did. They said the uh, the play-by-play -play guy said he's the Impact World Champion, and then um, Cole Cabana said, "I don't know if you're supposed to say that on the air," something like that. So that I don't. That's what it would. I it wouldn't make much sense if they're already not recognizing him being the world champion, and you know that's the flagship belt. I don't see putting the knockouts championship on Madison Rain uh, would be any different. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't I don't think so. I think if they're going to put the title on Madison Rain, they're putting it on her because of the storyline wise. Yeah, uh, I don't know if the w women of honor division even take takes part in the pay per views. I you know I, I have no clue. Um, I know I used to watch them on YouTube and everything, so I have no idea. The listeners can uh, let us know in the 
YouTube comments, but it seemed like they, they did tease it. Um, there was a promo with Austin Aries, you know, previous that we talked about last time where he had, you know, held up the title. So, I mean, it, I think they're acknowledging it, but they're doing it like, you know, little by little, slightly. Like, they're not throwing it out there right away. But someone had said on Facebook that Kenny King held up the title, you know, kind of like a, when a challenger picks up the title off the ground and looks at it. Uh, someone said Kenny King did that. So, Kenny King's going to be on Bachelor in Paradise. So, I'm excited about that. Um, as a uh, Bachelor and Bachelorette super fan. But this isn't about the Bachelorettes, it's about Impact Wrestling. Good episode this week. But what do you, what do you got on it overall? I thought it was a really uh, solid episode. Uh, I thought it was really one of the better ones of the year. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you. I thought from top to bottom it was uh, excellent. And the one thing, and as we get into it, I want to give big ups to the crowd out in Canada because they were really into the show and what I'm starting to notice with some of the wrestlers is, you know, sometimes when they have their little mishaps in the ring, you know, some smart fans, you know, are, will be known to chant, you know, you messed up. But it seems like these wrestlers really feed off of the energetic crowd. So I think they really want to go balls to the wall. And, you know, we know with that, with the nerves and everything like that, you know, sometimes it's easy to, you know, miss a spot or whatever the case may be. But credit to the crowd for not crapping on the wrestlers. So the opening match, Phoenix and Rich Swan was a little bit, little bit botchy. So even though the buzz was circulating about the match, a little bit botchy at first. You know, some some of the moves weren't super crisp. But the, the Impact fans in general have always been really respectful of the product. You know, they they don't um they've never trolled the wrestlers. So that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, but the opener was Rich Swan versus Phoenix. This was the one, even Dave Melter talked about it. So. You know, we had the conversation last time where I said I, f I really feel like some of the podcasters and stuff are are big influence influencers on the product, and he said something positive about it, and and now you see ratings go up a little bit. So, did this match deliver for you? As far as uh, you know, you knew it was going to be good. Um, you know, Rich Swan basically said it was going to be a classic, where where again it was a little clunky, so we were not on classic status, but you know, it wasn't too long ago. Last year was cool, but the year before, Impact didn't even put on a single match uh, under Dixie Carter. That could be a match of the year candidate. You know, this this kind of fit the bill for Impact. So what do you got on um, this match? This is the first time we've seen Phoenix since um, Redemption. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I'm a big cruiserweight guy. Um, I mean, I know this is X Division. And I like the fact that it seems like Dawn is taking a page out of the old ECW book. And I know WCW adopted it later where you start to show off with that type of uh, high-flying style, cruiserweight style match. So I hope this is something they decide to continue moving forward. And for the most part, they have. But yeah, it delivered. Um, botches and stuff like that, Like it doesn't really take away too much for the match for me. I mean, unless it's just, you know, where they blatantly miss a spot. Like I said, I think these these guys were amped up, you know, feeding off the crowd, excited and, you know, nerves and everything of that magnitude. I did, and I don't want to, you know, be overly critical about it. I did find it odd, you know, you barely debut Swan and then only to have him lose. But I think he'll be fine. It seems like they have big plans for him, just the way that he's been presented. So it was some great stuff for both of them. This is what I feel like the X Division should be. Um, I don't think it has to be super spotty. That's not what I mean. But I think the X Division should be very fast-paced. Now, that I, I don't want it to the point where there's no selling, you know, that indie style that where, you know, it's back and forth, this and this and this. No, one, no one's selling. There has to be a degree of selling, but it should be fast-paced too uh, with a lot of chain wrestling. That's what I, I, I kind of think the X Division should be. So this was really what, what my vision of the X division should be, but I, I really thought they delivered and, and I agree, you know, they, they give us a big rich Swan match early on where he loses, but crazier things have happened. You know, Tessa Blanchard's lost twice already. So, um, crazier things have happened, but, but it, but it was a good match. Yes. And then the post-match angle, uh, <laughs> it threw me off a little bit. And then until you know, obviously when, when you have a OV come out and then you have Callahan come out, and then, you know, I the, the one thing and, you know, credit to Impact, because, I mean, I know Pentagon has tattoos himself, but I think the one thing with tattoos we know, 
especially when you're trying to disguise as someone. Now, whether you have the tattoos in the same area as the person you're trying to impersonate is one thing, but not too many people have the same tattoos in the same area. So, you know, you take a second look and it's like, oh, okay. But I, I love that uh, the post-match angle. I thought that was nicely done. Me too. I actually bought it at first. I really thought, uh, you know, because on the indie, sometimes those two wrestle each other. And uh, I've, I've seen it live myself. So... I was kind. Of, I, I was like, oh, "Don't turn him against each other." There's, there's no point in that. And then it, then it kind of hit me. I was like, "Shit, that's not even him." So, I thought that was really killer. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, Sammy Callahan co- continues to deliver regardless of who his opponent is. So uh, that, that's what's making him such a top heel right now because he's getting heat against anybody he goes up against. You can say, uh, uh, you know, we were talking last week about. Um, the feud of like Ciampa and whoever the hell, um, his old tag team partner. So everyone I see it on Twitter all the time. Oh, he's just, you know, he's just tremendous heel. Like that's, he's only been a heel against one dude. You know (laughs) what, what happens when he go, goes against someone else that's popular over there, you know, can he continue that same heat? So that's, what's making Sammy Callahan so special. He's going over onto a next feud and he's still continuing to deliver. So man, props, props to them. And, isn't it crazy that OVE is actually entertaining and interesting now? I mean, think about half a year ago, where it's like, get these guys off TV. It's funny. I think where they were good were at uh, Bound for Glory, they caught on to the fact that, okay, they're not getting the reception that we anticipated them to get, and they were able to do the quick turn. Because sometimes you have in wrestling or any facet in life where people are so stubborn, like they want it this way, or in wrestling, you know, they want to keep pushing this guy this way or this gal this way, you know, and they see that it's not generating the positive feedback that they want from the fans and instead of adjusting to accommodate that you know they just stick to their you know their guns but OVE the thing that I love with OVE now is you think about at the start of the whole Eddie Edwards and Callahan feud they were kind of in the background but now we see OVE involved a little bit more so I I can appreciate that yeah and it sets up the six-man match next week so it's sammy and ove against phoenix pentagon and rich swan so that should also be phenomenal that should be a really good multi-man tag team match one thing that too you know you know the whole like ladder match thing where you're like climbing up a ladder and it's like balls ass slow you know you're um you're desmond xavier in the ring and you turn a congo kong when you're trying to climb the ladder like <laughs> what a comparison right right <laughs> but it's that same kind of concept with the mask you know like there's been so many times there's not a whole lot of mass wrestlers on TV anymore but like just say we'll use Rey Mysterio for instance you know like someone's going to unmask him and they're just slowly taking it off and making this big dramatic Sammy has actually ripped the mask off Pentagon that was done to perfection that he was able to block his face and then with Phoenix's mask, I mean, he got that thing half off. We saw his nose down. So, you know, they, they're really pushing the line with this to where it's like, hey, what, this guy could get unmasked. It's not It's not like a joke. It's not, they're not, you know, he's sitting there and taking it apart slowly and waiting for someone to run down to stop him. Like, he he's really looks like he's trying to do it. So, he's just uh, really delivering, putting in. Great work. So uh, the fo- the follow bond KM angle continues to where KM apologizes. So I don't really know where they're going with this at all, but I think some people hate it. But I, you know, I'm a KM fan, so I guess I'm engaged in it. But <laughs> um, I, I think ultimately KM is still gonna you know turn on him or whatever. Obviously, like, he can't be a babyface. So uh, that happened backstage. Allie and Madison Rain cut a promo. So Madison Rain kind of did her normal thing. You know, she says the same stuff most of the time, same hand gestures, all that. But Allie talks, and she's she's now like the new Allie. Like, she doesn't have the pink bunny costume on anymore. You know, she's wearing uh, black pants, um, almost like, like she's out there for a street fight. And that was the most serious promo she's ever cut. Like, so she cut one against Laurel Van Ness and when she won the title where it was like semi-serious. Um, she was still kind of flirting with the uh, the old alley, you know, the bubbly alley and, and too serious. So they're making the, the slow progression, but it seems like we're there now. Um, 
And even when she came out, we'll talk about the match in a bit, but when she came out, she had a new entrance. She wasn't jumping up and down, you know. So do you think we are now finally seeing, like, the alley that, you know, the the serious alley that we probably need to see if she's going to be one of the faces of the uh, the baby face side of the knockout division? I sure hope so. I mean, it's time for the evolution of the character. Uh, you look back when she originally started as Maria's assistant, then... You know, she was showing some, you know, where they show us that she's at can wrestle. Remember, she had went through the period of time where, like, she couldn't wrestle. And then, you know, you think till now. It was funny because when I seen her cut this promo, it kind of had a Raven-esque feel, at least for me. <laughs> so I was looking for her to, you know, do the Raven pose. Not really. But, yeah, um, I, I, I really think, I just hope it's something that they commit to. I think what they've done in the past, and I know it was the other regime, where they had her serious for one week, and then next week, you know, she goes back to the old, to the old valley. So hopefully they just commit to it. But I like this from her. Killer Cross took on Falabon in the next match. So this was uh, billed as Killer Cross's debut. And, uh, you know, they did this previously when uh, the Desi Hit Squad debuted, where they didn't say who their opponent was. And you assume it's going to be a jobber and jobber team, and it's you know Z and E. And then here we get him against Falaba, legit guy on the roster. And they did it again with uh, Katarina when she took on Rebel. They didn't you know say who her opponent was. So I don't know if I really mm-hmm. agree with that uh, that method. But Killer Cross at his debut, I thought the entrance reminded me a little bit of uh, the Ascension when they were popular, when they were good. I I don't know if you ever saw like their it was before like NXT even got that big, but there was like a, almost like a vampire gimmick. I didn't see, but I remember at one point in time, Bram used to be a part of them, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So it was while Bram was, um, it, it was, it was right after, I should say it was while Bram was part of him. And then right after they replaced him. So it, it was a little bit more of a vampire gimmick. They came down, like the music was, uh, I mean the, uh, arena was blue kind of, and they had a, epic entrance um and then they turn him into kind of turn him into shit after that but uh i kind of got that vibe here a little bit and um i th- i felt that he really played up to the gimmick so I, I've, I've already seen some people complaining on facebook that they're not they're not buying killer cross like i i'm buying it i think i i haven't seen a debut like this in a while to where he really was true to the gimmick and he was kind of impervious to pain, which, you know, a lot of heels don't do that. Impact is not doing the, um, the cowardly gim- uh, cowardly heel thing. You know, Eli Drake's probably the closest thing to that, but they're, they're making their heels, you know, people who want to go out there and fight. And when he had, when he was letting Falaba hit him and just like, just, Hey, hit me. And he wasn't feeling it. When he took the chair shot at the end, didn't feel it. Like, I don't remember seeing a, a character like that in a long time since since I was a kid really that just you know I don't really count Congo Kong because he's huge but that just didn't feel pain and it wasn't one-sided but follow Bob's matches of all even with EC3 have all been comedy up to this point and he goes out there and he, he basically for the most part just gets his ass kicked in a really serious manner so what do you got on Killer Cross's debut I'm a fan already. He, man, the way that they went about debuting him, this was excellent. The one thing, and I'm not even going to say that it's a big deal, I think I would have saved Falaba as maybe his third matchup, so the third person he faces versus his first. Not that there's any problem, but I guess normally when we see debuts, we see the debuting talent facing someone, especially when you have a bigger guy, they're facing a, a much smaller wrestler and they're just running through him. And Killer Cross did that. And then I think him using that choke, that just made him look more of a badass. I thought that was some, some crazy stuff. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, the Saito suplex, I thought that was really impressive. It would have been more impressive had Falaba not been taken off his feet so many times. I mean, he was taken off his feet... Uh, I think there, his debut match with Impact might have been with uh, Mario Bokura against Veterans of War, and I remember he was taken off his feet twice in that match. Um, if, if they were able to protect that a little bit more, this actually probably would have been even better. But uh, maybe we're going to get a match with him and with uh, Killer Cross and KM now after the the post match angle, which would be cool because KM is another big guy. Um, he would probably eat the pin just fine. You know, he was on the uh, 
on the channel and said that he's he's a company guy and he just does what he does and if he loses he loses um but i'm digging it isn't it different from the the you know the kevin cross we saw on global force wrestling jobbing out to bobby Roode? that's what i was thinking man <laughs> i was like you know how and it just comes to show you when you work for different companies and i know what you know they had their stuff during that time but don and you know this regime they seen something in him and i mean i think killer cross is going to be a big deal you know the the one thing and you know not to look too far ahead i do wonder if they'll run into kind of the same thing that they did with brian cage where you just have this guy so dominant and he goes undefeated you know to have you don't really want to have two undefeated guys on the roster like that because eventually you're gonna have to pit them together but not looking too far ahead I just thought this was excellent. And once again, this is their two impact is two for two. You know, having the debut of Rich Swan last week, that presentation of that, they did well and they did well with Killer Cross. See, I kind of actually disagree. I, I think keeping him undefeated and keeping uh, Cage undefeated would actually provide for a really, really good collision course down the road. You know, when I was growing up watching wrestling, you remember watching us Saturday mornings, even even watching WCW, like a majority of the matches were a star against a jobber. And you never really knew how good someone was or wasn't until they got real competition down the road. Um, I've, I've told this story before, you know, the, the first Monday Night Raw, the main event, I'll never forget, uh, Undertaker against Damian Demento. Damian Demento got his fucking ass kicked, but... I remember he was like, he was built up to the point where when when they actually had that match, I was like, damn, he might actually win. Like, I actually was actually buying it like he was some, you know, because he was undefeated. Um, you know, of course, after the match, I realized the dude was basically a, a jobber. I could see that with Killer Cross, too. Like, just you, you, you get to the point that when these two wrestle, you really don't know who's going to win. You know, I, I could just see a dominant run for each of them, but... But we'll see. Um, it's cool to get some some dominant heels like that. Yeah, if I can just add one thing, I think the only thing for it to be go off successfully is if you have two people undefeated, one of them needs to have a, accomplished something, whether that's won some gold or anything like that. Only because I think what what can happen too, and I mean, I guess comparing uh, Damian Demento, I don't remember how he was built up. I know you said he was undefeated, but I don't remember how he was built up up until then. But you see the aftermath after the loss. I don't. I don't. Did he even uh, stay remain with the company, or did they cut ties, or what happened? I don't remember ever seeing him again, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, great stuff. This this was great. But yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a weird comparison. But I, I guess basically what I'm getting at is that. I like when we get to we can get to a point where two guys have a match and you you just really know you really don't know who's gonna win, um, you know. I've always hated Impact does a good job with this, but I've always hated when a when a there's a wrestling pay per view and the guys keep getting their hands on each other, one upping each other, and then eventually you kind of get an idea of okay this is what they're gonna do, and um, Impact's doing a good job with that. We're gonna touch on that a little bit more with the main event shortly. Um, GWN flashback, our favorite moment of the show. This was a uh, <laughs> uh, Sting versus RVD. So we continue to get people, um, you know, tied to WWE in these uh, flashbacks. You know, uh, I mean, I would hope next week they do something with the original LAX for the flashback. Like that would make too much sense. But we're most likely going to get like Austin Aries versus Bobby Roode. Um, but this was quick. This wasn't, uh, it, it's almost like, uh, they listened to us. <laughs> right. That's what I felt like this. This was quick. This was fast. This was, you know, it didn't take, it wasn't a piss break. Yeah. I, you know what? The only thing I've always mentioned in the past too, if you're going to have people who are no longer with a company have them try to find matches that are them involved with people who are currently with the company. So like, you know, you had mentioned maybe next week they go with Austin Aries versus Bobby Roode. At least Austin Aries is with the company right now. So, you know, you could say like, okay, this was one of the matches that he had once upon a time with a, you know, I don't, I'm not going to call him legend, but former TNA star, such and such. I just, I've always just hate when it's people who have been year, both 
participants have been both years removed from the company. Sorry, I got tongue tied. <laughs> yeah, no, you're fine. Um, and RVD's run is not really one I want to relive in all honesty. And, uh, you know, I talk about this on Twitter a lot. Um, I, I've started pointing it out every day, you know, the GWN flashback, there, there's about a 95% chance it's, it's AJ angle rude or Joe. I mean, they just cannot be any more obvious. I mean, why not James storm? Like there hasn't been a single one of James storm. Yeah, they had one. It was short, though. It, they, I think the one that they had, which was a big highlight, they had the one where he defeated Kurt Angle for the world title. Yeah, but that was a long time. That was <laughs> I, I think, That was when he was still with the company. Yeah, I, another thing I want to see them do, and I get, you know, they're trying to market it and, you know, sell it to the casual fan. But for the promotional artwork, put people who are with the company. Don't put – I mean, if you want to put – a sting picture in the background you want to put aj in the background fine but i want to see the people who are with the company now at the forefront of course they're, they're not going to do that because they want to capitalize on the stars of yesteryear but i think that's what they should do i guarantee you mark my words on this the day that um ec3 gets called up to the main roster or wins a title in nxt because we haven't seen an ec3 flashback at all um I, mark my words, the next week after one of those things happen, we're going to see a GWN flashback AC3. <laughs> we'll, I, I will bet anything on it. I really liked the Desi Hit Squad uh, training with Gama Singh. Um, you know, just, just where he's like slapping him around. And uh, it, it was cool to see that side of him because the Desi Hit Squad got no kind of real build. You know, I, I think this would have been cool to watch up until their debut. You know, like that would have been cool to build it up that way. They're kind of doing it a day late, dollar short, whatever. But um, I, I kind of actually actually liked it a lot. Like I was like, this this is this is giving us something to care about with them. Like because we're we're you know they're showing us the behind the scenes, the training sessions. Like instead of just throwing a tag team out there and we're supposed to boo them or you know we get to know them. That's really, really important. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. I think, too, that they probably should have went this route, had a couple of the vignettes before having their debut match. Because I think, in slowly but sure, we'll get there. But they got to rehabilitate Rohit Raju's character a little bit. Because when you think about it, when they were mentioning it, the only thing we're seeing from Rohit Raju was him losing so I think when you have these and, you know, I'm guessing they're a tag team for the time being. I, I don't know if it was you or somebody had mentioned they think the group will expand over time. But I think these help. It's going to help both of them. It's going to help us get to know, is it Gersinder Singh? That is, yeah, Gersinder Singh. Yeah. It's going to help us get to know him better as well as rehabilitate Rohit Raju's character some. Uh, I don't know if you saw um, on the review at 411 Mania. They actually said we get a video hyping the arrival of Scarlet Bordeaux. So that was the one. Um, that was the one everyone's saying they think it is. <laughs> so that's what they put in the notes. Yeah, I seen that. I'm. Uh, I seen that. You know. Well, if they're wrong, you got to go out the room with pitchforks, man. Speaking of new knockouts, though, um, the Rise main event. Uh, you, you you couldn't script this. Uh, it was supposed to be. 30 woman Iron Man, 30 minute Iron Woman match, excuse me. Um, Delilah Doom versus Shati Blackheart, who I believe is featured in these uh, sets of tapings. And maybe she's just doing explosion. We don't really know yet. Maybe she's, uh, they use her as an enhancement talent. We're, we're, we'll see. But uh, they both broke their ankle a week before the Rise show. Uh, Real World broke their ankles. So uh, you, you couldn't script that any worse. And uh, that's we ended up getting the Mercedes, Mercedes Martinez versus Tessa Blanchard instead, and that just match was nuts. Uh, Thirty minute Iron Women match, and the place came unglued for it. Uh, and you're gonna see if you watch it, or at least you'll see like highlights. There was an angle with uh, Sue Young took on Soraya Knight, and and they they climbed up this ladder, and she put a um, up to like the rafters kind of, and put a kind of like a noose around Sue Young's neck and then like pushed her off. Oh, uh, wow. That... It was, it was crazy. The <laughs> place went pretty nuts over it. 
Um, so yeah, uh, definitely got to check that out. But Madison Rain and Allie take on Sue Young and the Undead Bridesmaid, which was very clearly Casey Spinelli. Um, at the Rise show, the uh, the Undead Bridesmaids were some of the Rise talent because uh, I could recognize a couple of them. But it was kind of funny because they weren't like a couple of them were doing the gimmick walk and then a couple of them were just walking slowly, but they looked completely normal. <laughs> like we're not like buying into it like they were supposed to, but uh, the bridesmaids do a really good job when they come out there. And uh, I think they are different girls uh, from the ones in Orlando, even though they look pretty similar, but I, I don't know. But yeah, this was very clearly Casey Spinelli. And uh, I wish they would have done a better job of hiding that because her ring gear looks so you, like you could tell it was her body, if anything. Yes, yes. I mean, from the hair to, like you said, her body. I, at first, I'm like, so who's this hot one that BQ's talking about? And then when I spotted her, I'm like, well, I don't think he was referring to Casey Spinelli. I mean, she's hot, too. But I knew you, you were talking about someone else. But let me ask you before we get into this. Is, is she somebody that's a local in Canada? Because it seems like we only see her, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if she's ever worked any Orlando teams, but we seem to see more of her when they go to Canada. Yeah, yeah, she's she's local there. Okay. So um, she wrestles for BCW a lot. Uh, I really I really hope they add. I mean, she deserves it. Um, she really deserves to be a part of the knockout roster. And, uh, you know, back when they did the Orlando taping after the last time we saw her, I shot messages to Allie and and uh, Sienna, and they both said they weren't familiar with her being on the roster. I woke up this morning to a, a message from Allie apologizing to me for not uh, recognizing me. She said she realized it was me after I walked away. <laughs> and uh, I felt bad. Like, she, was, she, she legitimately was like, I feel terrible. Like, I wanted to meet your daughter. I was like, well, you did. You just didn't know it was her. Uh, but yeah, I, I just uh, thought it was funny to, uh, to read that. Um, I said, I travel for impact all the time, girl. Like we will have another opportunity. All good. But, um, I, uh, speaking of Casey Spinelli, I actually thought she, she sold this like character pretty well. Like there was one point where she went for like a big boot and it was like in like slow motion. Did you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It, um, she, she did well. Yeah. And Something I wanted to say, this is a you know good point to mention it. I've uh, I've brought this up on past shows. That's why I'm like, dude, someone listens to these shows sometimes because I, I feel like a lot of the stuff I say gets that happens. But I heard Don Callis say this later. And basically what I'm getting at is when someone is a gimmick, Killer Cross too, for hit, you know, when someone is a gimmick, when they have the match, they have to they have to find a way to to, to keep the gimmick going, you know. Uh, you can still compete and still wrestle, you know, but you can't, you can't come to the ring, you know, like basically like a zombie bride and then get in there and start just, you know, wrestling like the rest of the girls, mm -hmm. you know, like you, you have to, you have to live the gimmick a little bit too. Um, so that's what I really liked about killer Cross's match is that I really felt he did that. I didn't feel like his entrance and his vignettes were one thing and then he gets in the ring and it's totally different. You know, like it just, it felt like it all really flowed and it was the same with, um, with, with K Casey Spinelli, what she did here. I mean, she, she kept, she, she was wrestling, but she kept an essence of the, uh, the undead bridesmaid. So, um, really, really kudos to that. What do you got on this uh, tag team match? This was the one I was actually looking forward to the most just because I was so intrigued by the fact that one of the bridesmaids was wrestling. <laughs> so I, I I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was just designed, at least in my eyes, just to continue what they've been doing with Madison Rain, building up Madison Rain. And it looks like, you know, judging by the post-match angle that we're going to get Tessa versus Allie, which that should be interesting. It gives Tessa an opportunity to... Uh, you know, I guess this would be her first major feud, feud since being a part of the company. I will say this, and I know I was joking about it online with some people, <laughs> and I know Impact doesn't really honor this, but what happened to Allie's uh, rematch clause? You would think after being buried, maybe they would have tried to finish that off between her and Sue Young before having her move on. Dude, they only do rematch clauses for the world title. Sometimes, because Pentagon didn't get a rematch, and uh, they seem to do it for the tag team title. No, they don't for that either. 
they're very selective with it. That's for sure. I think they just should just do away with it. Yeah, I just, you know, you, know, you just think, I, I guess, and, you know, like I said, I mean, it's no big deal, but, you know, Ali being, you know, one of the faces of the knockouts division, you would think there's still mileage left between a feud between her and Sue Young before, yeah, Sue Young move on. But, I mean, I'm interested to see what her and Tessa do. It's going to be very telling. If, if I'm going old school here for a little bit, um, before this rematch clause thing existed, usually if the title changes hands and it's due to interference or, or something like that, usually the, the, the person who lost the title will get a rematch. But if it's a clean victory, you know, end of the line. I think that's how it should be. And I know a lot of people are really unhappy with the push of Madison Rain, But if we can look past that for a second, what they're doing is trying to make her credible for the match with Sue Young. That That's what you're supposed to do in wrestling. Like the two people having the match are supposed to be credible. If this were a year ago, everyone would be like, Sue Young is winning the match. Like, now there's people who think Madison Rain's going to win. Yep. You know, we should go into it not knowing who's going to win. You know, she gets this, this mega push, and, you know, some people don't like it, but it, I think we're just so used to people getting the random title matches that we, we kind of forget, especially with the knockouts, we, we forget that, you know, once upon a time, the opponents were supposed to have, the challenger was supposed to have like a little bit of a build, a little bit of a push. So I'm okay with it because if we make a Sue Young wins, it's, it's just a bigger victory instead of, you know, Madison being, you know, feeling like a placeholder, which she, she is. But uh, at least she doesn't feel that way. I'll add this because I'm guessing I'm one, of, I'm one of these people that haven't really been a fan of the whole, her whole push. I just felt like the way they went about it, and I don't know if you had heard uh terrence had mentioned this to me on twitter but i guess she's number one contender for the is it the what, what do they call their women's title in ring of honor um i don't know <laughs> okay well <laughs> anyways remember. the way she became number one contender she won a fatal four-way and my thinking was you could have still had her be number one contender but have her win a multi-man match. I didn't like the fact that you had, her, you know, a span of three weeks, you have her beat Tessa twice and beat Taya. Ty I didn't think that those were victories that she needed to really push her to the front of the line. You could have done a multi-woman match, number one contendership, and done the same thing the way that Ring of Honor did. So that was really just my problem with it all. And like I said, I mean... I mean, I'm sorry, like you said, you know, it's good to walk into a match where you're thinking like, we don't know who's going to win. But <laughs> I mean, you think about it, there's, you know, you would prefer Sue Young to win because Sue Young probably needs to win more than Madison Rain does. But, you know, the pay-per-views in a couple of weeks, we'll see what happens. She needs the win so she can have a long reign and feud with Allie and Rosemary when she returns. Because if Madison Rain's, Rain wins, um, it's it's going to be more difficult to book Sue Young when she loses the title um, as far as a feud and keeping her momentum going, um, especially losing two straight pay-per-views. But if Tessa, I mean, uh, Madison wins, that just means Tessa is going to take the title off her and they're fast-tracking her. So I would just rather see Sue Young keep it as long as possible so that once Tessa eventually wins, like, you know, she, she works her way up to it and, and, uh, and earns it. The LAX Clubhouse... And this is getting this stuff is getting really good. Conan is letting King know that he's got he's got proof. So Diamante has has not shown her face in these. Uh, she wrestled on Explosion. I don't think it's aired yet, but I know she has a match coming up on Explosion. So I wonder what her role is going to be in this. Uh, some people have brought up the idea, which this makes too much sense, um, and that's for her to team with uh, the you know the new LAX and to bring Eva Lisa in to team with uh, the other side. You know, I could see something like that happening. Uh, hopefully, they don't bring back like Shelly Martinez or anything, but um, I think that would make a lot of sense. But if that were to happen, I think it would have been spoiled for us. I think we would that would be like common knowledge right now. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if Diamante is a part of these next couple shows or not, and. Uh, you know, or maybe something further happens at the pay per view, uh, you know, with, with Diamante and everything. And uh, I guess we'll talk about it more once we preview Slammiversary. But uh, obviously, these guys are going to have a match; it hasn't been announced yet. But it's uh, interesting to see what they're going to do because the uh, I don't know if they're fighting over the LAX name 
Um, we, you know, we're, we're going to get to that because we haven't even uh, got to the end of the show. So uh, let, let's get uh, let's get past that. Here's something, man, that um, I'm, I like that they're doing. So we get the Austin Aries video package, which was amazing. Uh, you know, talking about his his mother only loving losers. <laughs> and uh, I mean, dude, he said after Slammiversary, you better hope the XFL needs a shitty offensive lineman line of the night oh my dude i popped for that shit that was great but what they're doing with this moose ever since moose because we didn't even shit we didn't even see moose get the number one contendership on impact it was you know that match with eli drake outside of the arena but they're keeping these guys off television they're not if anything madison rain has been like the strongest book person on the show you know they don't have like moose wrestling every week running through everybody austin aries running through a bunch of people we don't want to have austin aries and his partner against moose and his partner and uh you know or the show ending with austin aries getting the upper hand and the next week moose gets the upper hand like uh they are keeping these guys off tv they're promoting the match through video packages and uh, i said this on the b side not too long ago this was after i watched the uh ufc last month when when cm punk fought and I said, man, the main event rolled around and like it just had this huge, big fight feel. And Impact has not been able to do that for their main event in quite some time. And I wasn't sure how to do that. Maybe this gets us there. You know, like these guys, I, I wish they had more heat instead of like the generated heat that they kind of gave them. But, uh, you know, we're not seeing them wrestle on TV. It's it's again, I, I know I talk about growing up watching wrestling as a kid, but that's what it was like when you saw Hulk Hogan versus whoever in the main event, like they didn't touch each other until the the, the match happened, you know. So, you know, what do you think about how they're how they're doing this? This is very different. Yeah, I think, you know, the one thing us all wrestling fans were conditioned to believe, you know, because a certain company does it a certain way where people are feuding and then with weeks leading up to the pay-per-view, we'll see different iterations of them facing one another, whether it's a tag team match, a singles match or whatever. Um, I really love the work that Austin Aries is doing. And I will say this, man. I mean, it the way that the story that they're telling – you know, a lot, a lot's going to be riding on Moose. Can Moose get it done? And honestly, I could see a scenario where if they have the match and say, because obviously we know Austin Aries is the heel in this and Moose is supposed to be the face. But if they get a scenario where like similar to what we had last year with OV and LAX, I could see them, you know, pulling an audible and, you know, whatever decision they might have had, you know, going against it. Just because the way the, with, on the Austin Aries side of things, I mean, he's just, I mean, even in, when they uh, had their confrontation, I'm like, and, you know, I, I just feel like there's a lot of pressure on Moose to really deliver. I mean, I think this is his big, big shot. And I mean, if he falls short and I mean, and doesn't deliver, I mean, I don't know what to say. But great. It, it, it was some excellent work on Austin Aries. And I think turning him heel was a no brainer. Yeah, it was really smart to do. Um, Moose has, has always delivered at the pay-per-views, though. He's always turned it on. Um, you know, he'll take, he'll do some kind of high-flying move he hasn't done. You know, he brings the special entrance, you know. Um, I think he's going to turn it up. And I think the main event is actually going to be one people really talk about, it, talk about, even though they might not be necessarily super excited. I think it's going to over-deliver. And this is what I say about under-promise, over-deliver. I think that's what they're kind of doing with this like they're if anything like i said they're they're hyping up madison rain more than they're uh hyping up moose and uh you know to use another comparison and this is for the the non-virgins out there um it's kind of like when you have sexual relations with a girl for the first time and it's like really hot and heavy and then after it's been like 10 times 12 times whatever you know you're in a relationship or whatever it just it gets like really routine and that's what it's the same concept with wrestling. Like keep, keep these guys away from each other or they're going to give away the match already. They're going to give away the spots and, and, and everything like I want. And I, that, I mean, I'm saying right now, I wonder what Moose is going to do. That's what we're saying. We don't know what he's going to do. He always does something different. Like I like thinking like that, you know, rather than these guys wrestling in the ring all the time, or, you know, even a sneak attacks. And then we just, we just have an idea of what it's going to look like. You know, we want to keep, keep it hot, keep the feud hot. So, they're just doing really good with that. 
Tommy Dreamer cuts another great promo, and, and and they're continuing the cursing. You know, I don't want them to go overboard with it, which I don't think they are, but they're continuing the cursing. And I, I've been saying this for years now. The reason white meat baby faces can't get over is because they don't talk like people talk. And I brought this up when Eddie was a champion, when Drew Galloway was a champion. When you're out there cutting a promo like, you can knock me down, but I'm going to get right back up because I try real hard and I got the people behind me. Like, we, people do not talk <laughs> like that. You know. Oh, <laughs> so... Now we got, you know, Eddie where he, he's cursing. He's, show, he's showing a side that people can actually relate to. I, I just like that they're doing it. Uh, I don't want them to go overboard. But, you know, he said, like, you think I'm fucking your wife? She's 25. Have you seen what I look like? That, uh, he killed it with that line right there. I'm buying into this feud as well. I like to where, you know, Tommy walked away and then Eddie had the House of Hardcore match with him. Basically making him come back so now they're going to have a house of hardcore rules match at the pay-per-view and i know that's kind of what tommy dreamer does but last time we saw this was that redemption and i was i thought that was the best match on the card so what do you think of uh the tommy and eddie thing right now if sammy can get heat with someone else if eddie can keep his momentum going with someone else that is a good thing you know, I'm interested to see where they go with this because I liken Dreamer to Foley in a sense. These are guys that they do a great job of getting someone over if they really want to get someone over as like just as uh, so. And I think of example of Edge when to what really put Edge over the top was that match that he had with Foley where I think he speared him through a table, a flaming table. Something I, I, you know, it was over a decade ago. But I just really wonder, because I, I know Dreamer is going to really put Eddie Edwards over strong. But I just wonder what's the route that they'll want to go. Because I think they've committed to this unhinged Eddie Edwards character. And if that's the route they're, they're going to go with him, you know, they got to be able to build off of it. Like you had stated earlier, when someone's a good heel for one particular feud, that has to kind of travel. We can't, you can't just be for with one participant. So I just think we've seen Eddie lose his mind with Callahan and now he's losing it with Tommy Dreamer. Is he going to be, you know, loose cannon Eddie Edwards? I, I'm just interested to see how they follow up with all this. But as far as the match, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is one of the matches that I'm looking forward to seeing at the pay-per-view. Eddie's got a great new theme song. I don't know if you've heard it. I didn't like his old one. Um, you know, the Wolves one is so iconic. And then he got the... Ooh, that, that's my wolf howl. Um, that that one wasn't good. Uh, his new one is really, really good. It's, it's very catchy, and it fits his new character. Um, I actually thought they were going to give Allie something similar, something different as well, since she's uh, evolving. But does it look like to you that Eddie? Uh, I don't know if it's just the way he's dressed, but he he looks like less muscular. I, like, no, I he almost looks like he's not working out. I didn't notice that, but I've noticed uh, throughout some of the shows, and I mean, I can't think of it at the top of my head, but, you know, you got to look at it like this. These wrestlers hard, you know, are on the road, and it's probably hard to maintain, you know, get, you know, you're working so many shows, and then on top of that, trying to find a local gym, you know, and then get hungry, it's hard to diet, like, so for the ones that are able to stay in tip-top shape, kudos to them, but you think about it. Since we've seen Eddie change into this character, he's really been in street gear. We haven't really seen him. I can't recall the last time we've seen him actually wrestle. And I'm talking about before he turned, you know, change into the character that he's in now. You know, when he was still regular Eddie Edwards, he had his tight, you know, the green tights. So, and that that's another thing that I want to see. What attire is he going to be donning moving forward? Right, and, they get, and I'm going to go back to what I said about he's got the new gimmick, so he has to wrestle a new style you know a really good example of someone who didn't do that was was broken matt hardy uh, you know he was all theatrics and then he got in the ring and it, it was the same move set you know other than him biting people which became more of a like a comedy thing um same exact move set you know there, there was no difference when matt hardy got in the ring i remember when ec3 had his road to redemption and he had to wrestle all these people he lost that mike bennett had him going up against He's like, uh, next week you face Matt Hardy. And that was his first match after being broken. And I'm like, dude, I really can't wait to see what he does. 
And it was the side effect. It was the running bulldog. It was all the same shit. So this, this is really important that when Eddie starts um, getting these matches under this gimmick that, that he takes on that persona, I'm even thinking maybe because uh, maybe he's losing weight on purpose to look a little more stressed out. You know, I, I think sometimes they have him like kind of unshaven. I think he should like not have a full beard, but he should look disheveled, you know, like like he can't focus um, on anything other than than wrestling. So it kind of makes sense. Maybe maybe he is like losing some weight. Like he even looks more pale to me, too. Like he like he doesn't have a tan anymore. Yeah, I, maybe I, that's all being done on purpose. Yeah, I didn't catch that. And not to get off topic, the one thing I was thinking is fun. You mentioned up the broken Hardy or well, Matt Hardy for that matter. You know, you think about, you know, we're a couple years removed from all that drama. You know, he's the last person who should who should have ever had any issues with the company because he impacts the only company to make him a two-time world champion. That's one of the things, you know, you think about some of the flag that impacts gets. They made Matt Hardy a two-time world champion. Just uh, some food for thought. I was going to say two-time, but yeah, that's right. He won at Bound for Glory, and then they had him... Uh... That was so silly when he gave up the title because of like EC3 tried to sue him or something. <laughs> <laughs> so so ridiculous, dude. Um, yeah, you're right though. Um, so yeah, uh, they're just doing really good character progression with this stuff, and I don't mean to keep hammering this home, but um, you know the character has to continue in the ring, and they're they're doing a good job with that. Uh, Katarina had her debut match, if you will, her return match. He was against Rebel. So both baby faces, um, they didn't promote the match. Uh, Rebel, as of now, is not a knockout on the website. But in the uh, Back to Basics photo shoot, uh, they just did her. So I, I would imagine she's part of the roster. Um, you know, she was in Orlando and she's in Canada now. So she's traveling with them. Uh, we will see. I really hope so. Um, what I've been reading online is that, uh, people didn't think it was good and, you know, saying rebel can't wrestle. Like I really, I really disagree. Um, yeah, there were some sloppy moments. Like they definitely had no chemistry, but I think it's really obvious that rebel has improved. I mean, if, you, if you're thinking of like the dollhouse rebel, uh, the, the knockouts knockdown rebel compared to now, like she's obviously improved quite a bit. And, uh, I, I just love Rebel. She's got that beautiful peach on her, man. Yeah, she's serviceable. I mean, you know what? We we can't ex we can't expect everyone to be, you know, mat technicians. There's some people who are able to get over on showmanship or, you know, something else. Uh, like this was fine, I, and I think, you know, these are one of these type of matches we talk about sometimes where, you know, it seems like. You know, you run through the roster, and then it seems like you're facing the same people over and over. And you can only do so many squash matches. And I think that that was a good thing about this show, because if you think about it, could you imagine if we would had a Killer Cross facing enhancement talent, Katarina facing enhancement talent? You know, you don't want to see two squash matches in the same show. So I mean, it it was fine. I mean, both gorgeous women. The thing that I love, I love the commentary on Don Callis is in about Grado, like the shots that he takes is Grado. It just had me dying. I wish Don Callis, he's doing a tremendous job, but I would like to see him play more of the heel role. Like he did a redemption, um, you know, calling the people stupid in the audience. And um, I would like to see that clear cut baby face. Josh Matthews is sounding a little bit more like he did with the Pope, um, which where I think he was at his best. Uh, I, I don't want funny Josh Matthews at all. I don't mind when they're behind the scenes doing the green screen shit, which I hate. Uh, I, I don't mind if he, if he has a little uh, personality then, but he, he's like opposite. Like he's up there standing, you know, real serious and dorky. Um, always doing that thing where he interlocks his fingers. But uh, on, on commentary, I, I would just like to see the just the old school where he's just this clear cut baby face. And then Don, Don Callis is like the clear cut heel. Like they still kind of uh, go in and out, but but I didn't mind this. Uh, I think Grado just has the best music. And uh, after the match, uh, she says she has a surprise for Grado and it's his friend Joe Hendry. Uh, I think this is very obvious. 
Um, people have been calling this for weeks when they knew Joe Hendry was going to be on the show. Uh, but I, th- I think it's very obvious that there's going to be like a, you know, a turn on Grado to where she's actually uh, dating him, you know, because they keep bringing it back to, you know, how did he get her? How did he get her? <laughs> uh, you know, he tried to take his shirt off and she's like, no, 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 keep it on. You know, like, I don't know. Do you, do you feel like that's where it's going? Totally. I mean, you could see yeah. it. Or what, what do you always say? Stevie Wonder could see it, right? Through a brick wall, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I was just going to add on. I think with Don, uh, and it's certain wrestlers, because I know Grado's one of them, but we, I've at least on my end, I've heard him, you know, say some hillish things. Like, I know with Grado, you know, call him all oh, this idiot or something of that magnitude. It's certain wrestlers, it seems like he has kind of like a, a vendetta against. So I think we're kind of there with with Don, but I agree with you as far as with Josh. I mean, he, you know, he sounds kind of similar to how he goes with the Pope, and I think that's he did his best work with the Pope. Yeah, just like a little more energy. He kind of speaks with, you know, yells with a deeper voice. Um, but yeah, uh, main event of the evening was Cage versus Congo Kong. I thought this was freaking excellent. Like, I don't like seeing Kong lose like he he keeps you know picking fights with the big guys and sometimes he wins sometimes there's a you know I think with Johnny Impact there was a non-finish and he lost to Moose that's the last time we've seen Moose wrestle I think um Congo Kong for the most part if, if maybe it maybe I tuned out but it, this almost seemed like a squash match you know where like Cage was just showing I mean finally Cage was doing some stuff to where the crowd was giving him what he deserves and, you know, he did a superplex. Um, I thought this really delivered for a main event. Um, it had the potential to be like Congo Kong versus Moose, where it was like really boring. But uh, Cage really turned it on. And, and like we've been talking about, I wish they would just go back to number one contender matches instead of, you know, Madison Rain. Oh, they told me if I beat Taya, it wasn't a number one contenders match. They told her if she beats Taya, she'll get a title shot. Um, Cage, if he beats Congo Kong, he'll get a title shot. Like they're making him earn it, kind of. But I just want to see number one contender matches. But um, I just, I just, I was entertained by the match uh, for the most part. Like I said, maybe, I, maybe I tuned out, but I don't remember Kong getting a whole lot of offense in here. No, he got enough. You know, the only thing I was thinking once the match ended, and I thought this was probably one of Congo Kong's best, if not the best showing he's had since he's been in Impact. I really would have loved this to be uh, on the pay-per-view. Like, had had we, you know, had they uh, promoted this match, it, then it would it could have been presented as Brian Cage's biggest challenge. Because I think, you know, now, where do they go with Kong from here? You know, and like I said, I, I think it, in, you know, nowadays we see with wrestling, you know, wins and losses, I don't think they're as significant as they once were. But I just really thought, man, if this was on the pay-per-view, they could have really had weeks to build it. You know, this is Brian Cage's biggest challenge. And like I said, it wasn't a squash. Kong Kong was able to get enough in to make it respectable. But there was no doubt in anybody's mind that Brian Cage was winning this. And credit to Kong for pulling off that hurricanrana. That was something neat for somebody of his size. I saw a um, at at an indie match a clip on Congo Kong's Facebook where he did a um, I mean I've seen him go for it before we saw him do it at Global Force Wrestling he d- goes for the moonsault but he always misses like mm-hmm. I actually saw him hit it um, I think he one day he's gonna hit that on Impact um, and it's gonna be very special I mean if he ever wins a title it'll be like that but I agree uh, Cage looked great here he looked amazing really looked like a star and. Uh, it's good to see him in the main event considering he's going for the X division title. Uh, but I agree with you. I don't know what, where you go with Kong here. Cause Kong Kong has really short feuds. You know, they're just doing one match a piece um, moves on to the next guy. Sometimes he wins. Sometimes he loses. Who, who's, who is he going after next? Um, I agree. I don't know. I don't, I don't even have a, the, the slightest clue what they can do with him. Um, but but now they're at a point where they got to start trying to make him strong again. After that one, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jimmy Jacobs. He cuts. I love his promos every single time. But um, as long as they're together, I want to see them featured. You know, if Kong was just wrestling by himself, I could see where he's like more of a special attraction. But 
Jimmy Jacobs is doing a killer job, but they, they got to find something for, for Kong to do now. Uh, you know, a few that he can win and then, then move on and be, and be strong. So, uh, very end of the match here, uh, end of the night. And they always do this when the main event isn't one of the, uh, marquee guys necessarily. Um, which I guess you could argue that with cage, but LAX, um, the angle where Conan says he's got proof. I thought the proof was, I thought the promos were good. I thought the proof was a little weak where he's like, you know, those phone calls, they never happened. And it was kind of like, we're silent waiting for like the proof. (laughs) And then you realize that's the proof. You know, this was the one thing on the, on the set of tapings. I don't know about yourself that, that was spoiled for me. Um, uh, the, everything else has been a complete surprise. Um, I think I, yeah, I can't think of a single thing. Um, I, I completely avoid social media for the tapings now, uh, but but everyone put the LAX thing out there. They pulled the trigger on this because uh, Homicide returned with uh, Hernandez, and you know I I, uh, I don't want to say I reported it, but I I mentioned a rumor, man, probably around Bound for Glory, where I said. Uh, I was told that Hernandez was in talks with the company again. Um, this was, this was around when I was like talking about the Tessa initial Tessa Blanchard rumors with Ricochet and all that. Um, but it didn't make sense to me. I was like, why would they bring him back? Like, why would they add him to LAX at this point? And homicide has been like an afterthought. And when they kept saying, Oh, where's homicide? I thought he was like out of the company and they were just trying to find a way to like, you know, when you're watching a movie, uh, like meet the Fockers and you know, Denny, the brother is like not cast in the movie. So in the first 30 seconds in the movie, like, well, ever since Denny went away to military school, like they'll always write off the character at the very beginning of the movie. Uh, that's what I thought they were doing with homicide. I thought maybe he was, he was gone, but, um, he returns with Hernandez. They pulled the trigger on, on, on really, they, they like to throw away the dream dream match term around a lot, even when it's not, but this time around, uh, this is kind of like a dream match. Like this is, this is one of the coolest things that people are looking forward to next week's episode because they gave us a cliffhanger and they gave us a reason to, and people are looking forward. Like what's, you know, I, I, I would imagine they're probably going to kick off the show, but uh King and the old LAX. And now we're going to know what are they fighting for? Are they fighting for the name? You know? Um, and if they are, then maybe this whole thing is short lived, but, um, yeah, g- give me your thoughts on this, man. Yeah, I at first I, I will admit I was kind of confused a little bit. Then I kind of put the pieces together because I had wondered. I said, wouldn't it make more sense for Conan to align with Homicide and Hernandez just with the history? But then you think about it too. The whole point of Homicide baby turning on Conan is when he seen Conan had found Santana and Ortiz, you know, jealousy kicked in and, you know, this new LAX has been getting all all the limelight. So, you know, then I was like, okay. And the thing that I loved, too, and nothing against Conan, because I enjoyed him. I actually enjoyed him when he used to wrestle. I love that he got a part of this beat down as well, because in the past, when you think about LAX, when they've been beaten up, you know, you see Conan kind of retreat you know, he's in, they, they take the camera away from him, but yeah. the, the camera's not showing on him, I should say. And uh, in this in this segment, we've seen King actually choking Conan out, which I thought made it impactful. You know, I, I don't know if the name OGs, is that what they're going with or if that's something that people, because I, too, unfortunately, this was spoiled for me. And I see, you know, everyone was using the term OGs. I prefer them using OGs versus having it be LAX versus LAX or new LAX versus old LAX. I never like when you have two stables of the same name and the only change is old versus new. But this is some interesting stuff. And, you know, hopefully I'm hoping I know Homicide's still serviceable. I don't know Hernandez. I mean, he, he looked like he's aged, you know, quite a bit. Oh, my God. I, yeah, you know, he doesn't look like he has in I mean, I guess, you know, father times undefeated, obviously, but you know, he doesn't look, you know, at, you, when you think about when he was a uh, super max, you know, he looks far removed from that. So I just wonder, you know, the match quality wise, but this is this is cool. And, you know, I just hope not to look too far ahead. I, I really think they found something with King in this this whole uh, angle with LAX. And I just hope they're able to keep him around because I really think he's been money since returning to the company. Yeah, this this screams um, one-off. Um, 
for those guys. Uh, it screams King is done after this. Uh, the old LAX guys are done after this, and I hope it's not, but it would be very difficult, depending on how they book this match. I would imagine it'll be a 51-50 street fight. Uh, I could be wrong, but... Uh, I mean, because with someone like that, you can't just have a regular tag team match. So, you know, are we going to see the old LAX have in, in action? Are they going to have matches? Um, if so, I hope they find them some jobbers because I would hate for them to feed Z and E to them. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't. I, I could see LAX OGs or something like that. You know, hopefully they don't do like Undertaker versus Undertaker, you know, uh, that type of thing. Um, but I, I could see them doing LAX versus LAX. But I am. This is this is an angle that I'm like really want to know what's next, and I, I really think no company is touching this storyline. I've said it a few times the Sammy Eddie stuff, even though they're not even feuding, and then uh, even the 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 Rosemary stuff with you know. I mean, you just know that she's hurt, but at least they like wrote her off in a storyline way to where you can't wait to know what's next, even though that's not really the angle at the moment because Sue Young's dealing with with uh, Madison, but. I kind of like how they're having storylines um, instead of like the traditional wrestling, like a storyline ends and moves on to the next. They're like intertwining and they're not really finished. That keeps it really interesting. Can they do that with LAX though? Can they can they make this something that's long lasting? They made LAX versus OVE last a lifetime, what it felt like, and they did a good job with that. And um, Homicide, we've only seen him wrestle a few times. There was the time he jobbed out in you know ten seconds, Alberto El Patron. They, I think they did like a handicap match where El Patron won, beat them one on three. There was another tag team match where he actually got some action in there. Uh, I think it was against OVE. And then they did the Barbed Wire Massacre, obviously, which was the one time we saw like Homicide really compete, <laughs> which was kind of funny because, you know, up to that point, he was doing nothing. Um, and then it, he wrestled on Explosion against Phantasma. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I, I yeah. remember that. That was just funny. The LAX music plays and he just comes out by himself. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, It was funny, too, that both King and Conan, or like LAX and Conan both came out with the same music. You know, like the, poo, 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 the LAX music. I'm curious because the LAX song says Homicide in it. You know, so I wonder if the music will change or they just take out the voice or what. So... This will actually be really interesting, but this is um this is huge. I I just think this is something people actually have a reason to, to care about for the next episode, and be like, man, I really want to see what's next. I think what they should do would be in we had seen this before, you know, King had got exposed. Where remember when they would head to the back the backstage segments or the vignettes of LAX, you know, they'd have the first intro and then the music would change, you know, when uh, upon King's arrival. I would probably just do the same thing with their music, but then, like I say, you know, when you have the shots go off, then you go, you know, I use the music that they were using for King for the OGs. I, I hope they stick with the OGs versus calling it old, the OG LAX versus new school L LAX. Just have LAX versus OGs. I think, you know, people would know wh what they're referring to when they're talking about OGs. I have a feeling um, viewership is going to be in a good place next week. I think a lot of people want to see what happens with this. And then, the, you know, the opening match with Swan and Phoenix was so good. And, that you know, they, they very early on, they didn't wait till later. They booked that six-man for next week. So, uh, you know, th this is going back to the thing where Sammy and, and Pentagon are going to get their hands on each other. But they also have a gimmick match with a pay-per-view. So, you know, I, I can see it. Um, them getting away with it. So next week we got the six-man tag. And then uh, D'Angelo Williams returns to Impact Wrestling. So we'll see what his role is. They're saying he's training moose but maybe uh i don't know maybe he turns on you know they're gonna overbook the main event uh slam reversary yeah, maybe not overbook it but you know it's it's probably not gonna be a clean finish um i, I hope it is because i think it'll over deliver like i said but i, I can see maybe down joe williams uh turning <laughs> um it doesn't seem like he's returning to the nfl so maybe he is going to wrestle so, you know we'll we'll see yeah, that you know that'd be a good role from. That's what I was thinking too, because you know you think about free agency and you know the position that he plays, you know that's really a young man's position. So maybe transitioning into wrestling would be something good for him, because you think about the last time we seen him, he did fairly well. So for him to return, 
I think he's going to add an interesting wrinkle to the whole Austin Aries Moose feud. So, you know, hopefully, like I said, with the match, I don't, I would hope he's not the determining factor as far as who wins. But I mean, you know, we've both watched enough wrestling to know when you get kind of some some of these uh, where they're aligned with the baby face or aligned with the heel or whatever the case may be, there's always something fishy happens. Exactly. You, you hit that right on the head. We, we know enough of wrestling to know something, uh, something could pop off. So, you know, they let us know ahead of time he was coming instead of just, you know, him showing up or then let us know the day of they, they released the spoiler, so to speak themselves. So I think they're toying with that. I think they really want people to see what is coming, um, on impact instead of focusing so much on the highlights and hoping people turn in tune in the next week. I think now they're like, okay, let's, let's give them something ahead of time and see if that helps. And, uh, so I, yeah, I think next week, um, I couldn't see the viewership down for it. That would make no sense to me, but yeah, excellent episode. Um, we ran kind of long, kind of like we did last week. You got any uh, closing thoughts, though? Oh, just uh, overall, from top to bottom, I enjoyed it. And um, I just found it funny, like, because I find myself looking at the ratings sometimes, like I said, just to kind of get an idea of how the things go. And, you know, even when I go on, you know, the site, the same site that you go on, I see what they rated. And, you know, it gives me an idea, idea of, you know, what some people thought, because everyone's opinion differs. But... I, you know, hopefully uh, the thing that I hope as far as just with the ratings, all I'll say is I hope they're able to find a number and be able to dance around that number. So if their number is anything over, you know, 300K, like if they're ad- averaging 300K, I'd like for them not to go underneath that. Find a number that's something that they can average on a regular basis and then build from there instead of kind of, you know, one week going so low and then next week going so high. Only because I feel the times when it does go low, like you were stating with some of these podcasters who might be critical of impact, some of the fans who don't watch the show or some of the people who don't watch the show, they go and click and see that the ratings are low. And their first thing is, oh, well, see, nothing's changed. Same old thing. And it's unfortunate that, you know, they're going based off of one, you know, poor week versus the weeks that they've done well. So that's just my my take. Totally agree. I think we would all like to see it hover around uh, 300K. Let's Let's hope that's what they do. And, um, you know, I think it hurt him because I think the tape, the tapings after redemption in Orlando just weren't good. Um, I remember reviewing them. Um, I would say I easily out of the last four episodes didn't, didn't like, um, no, yeah, actually I liked the last two. So there was, there was two, the, um, two, I really didn't enjoy at all, but overall I just thought they were, I just didn't, I didn't think they were that good. Um. And the Orlando Club crowd was so bad for those tapings. I mean, that's probably the worst they've ever been. And, uh, you know, they're very hit or miss. Sometimes they do a great job, but pretty much that whole set of tapings was awful um, with that. And now now we're seeing a, a raucous crowd, and it's it's awesome. Um, I wish I would have said this earlier because I know a lot of people don't make it to the end of the podcast. But P.D. Williams was saying on his podcast that he heard, uh, you know, he, he, he heard how loud it was in the arena and saw that, you know, like I often say, it doesn't really translate to TV. Um, I talked with his podcast partner and, uh, he, I, you know, we had a conversation and he, I basically said, Hey, maybe PD can be the guy that steps up and says something. Hey, you know, the crowd is, um, overly compressed. You guys are, are turning up the volume for the announcers and turning up the volume of the action, turning down the volume of the action. So let's see if there's a change, but, uh, I thought this past episode sounded a little bit better. So, uh, that will do it for us. Um, again, we ran kind of long today. If you uh, made it all the way through, congratulations. Thank you very much. I hope you consider becoming a subscriber if you're not already. And for Roe, I am BQ. This is the Impact Lounge, Impact Review, and we'll talk to you next time. Peace.